Welcome to the New Church Podcast. Well, today is the day that we call Palm Sunday, the day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and people shouted, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of Yahweh, the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel, waving palm branches and putting their coats on the ground to make a sort of red carpet. This was the moment Jesus was riding into the city of David, Jerusalem, Zion, to establish his kingdom, power, and glory. This is the moment they've been waiting for for a thousand years, ever since King David had died. Today we're looking at the books of First and Second Kings. And like Samuel, originally it was just one book. Book of Kings. The story picks right up where Samuel left off. David had conquered all of Israel's enemies. He had united the kingdom. God had promised David that his descendants would remain on the throne until the day the great messianic king, the Messiah, who would also be one of his descendants, until the day that he would establish an eternal kingdom and fulfill the promises that were made to Abraham. He would be the future king of all kings and Lord of all lords who would bless the peoples of the whole earth. And David's reign as king, it had started really strong, but he had a tragic personal moral failure that pretty much destroyed his family and rippled through the lives of everyone around him, weakened the nation that he had worked so hard to unite. And as we start the book of Kings, David's an old man. He is shivering in his bed, waiting to die. His son, Adonijah, he decides it's time to take the throne for himself. Even though everyone knew that David had already promised the throne to his other son, Solomon. Typical family drama, right? Brotherly love, grasping for power. Everyone schemes, everyone makes their plans. Eventually, Solomon ends up on the throne and Adonijah ends up dead. As we read about David blessing his son Solomon as king, encouraging him to remain faithful to God, Man, it almost seems hopeful and sweet, except for the parts where David makes him promise to murder all of David's enemies. Well, David dies. Solomon becomes king. And at first, it seems like things are going to be really great. Solomon asks God for wisdom. And God is so pleased with Solomon's request. Instead of asking for power and glory and long life, that he promises that Solomon will be the wisest person who will ever live. It seems like things are finally going to go great for Israel. Solomon builds a temple for God, a temple for the Lord. It's going to be the place where the presence of God will dwell in a special way on the earth. It's where the Ark of the Covenant is going to be. People from every nation on earth, they're invited to come and to pray and to worship God at this temple. And then we have this long section. It describes the building of the temple, how beautiful it was. All the imagery, it's it's echoes of the Garden of Eden, a time when God dwelt with mankind in a peaceful paradise. And we're also told about some deals that Solomon made with other kings, trading to get all the materials that he was gonna need to build that temple. Well, when it's all finished, they got a big wor- they have a big worship service. They dedicate the temple. God's presence, it fills the temple with his glory. And Solomon, he prays this amazing prayer, promising to be faithful to God, promising to make the temple a place for all people of all nations for all time. 
like all the way to you and me. Listen to this little excerpt from chapter 8. In the future, foreigners who do not belong to your people, Israel, will hear of you. They will come from distant lands because of your name. For they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your powerful arm. And when they pray toward this temple, then hear them from heaven where you live and grant what they ask of you. In this way, all the people of earth will come to know and fear you just as your own people Israel do. They too will know that this temple that I have built honors your name. And then the people, man, they worship their hearts out. They sang, they prayed, they sacrificed. And then God, he appears to Solomon in chapter nine, and he says this, the Lord said to Solomon, I have heard your prayer and your petition. I have set this temple apart to be holy. This plate you have built where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. As for you, if you will follow me with integrity and godliness, as David your father did, obeying all my commands, decrees, and regulations, then I will establish the throne of your dynasty over Israel forever. I made this promise to your father David, one of your descendants will always sit on the throne of Israel. But if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the commands and the decrees I have given you, if you serve and worship other gods, then I'll uproot Israel from this land that I have given them. I will reject this temple that I've made holy to honor my name. I will make Israel an object of mockery and ridicule among the nations. And though this temple is impressive now, all who pass by will be appalled and they will gasp in horror. They'll ask, why did the Lord do such terrible things to this land and to this temple? And the answer will be because the people abandoned the Lord their God who brought their ancestors out of Egypt, and they worshiped other gods instead and bowed down to them. That's why the Lord has brought all these disasters on them. Now, if you had to guess what happens in the rest of the book of Kings, what do you think? How do you think the rest of this story is going to go? Solomon got busy using that giant brain of his to make the most powerful nation on earth. First thing he did was marry the Pharaoh's daughter to make Egypt an ally, even though God had specifically forbidden Israel to ever make deals with Egypt. He also wasn't supposed to take foreign wives, but he married hundreds of women and made hundreds of political partnerships. In fact, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 17, which is a list of the things that kings were forbidden to do, Solomon did every one of them. He acted like it was his personal bucket list. He even instituted slavery to get all of his building projects done. He also ripped off those kings that he made deals with to get the building supplies for the temple. It's not a good start. He made a bunch more temples, too, for all the false gods of his pagan wives. His kingdom, it looked more like Egypt than the Israel that Moses had described. And Solomon, he was more like Pharaoh than his father, King David. So everything that happens next, it's not like God didn't warn him. And we're tempted to be like, dude, Solomon, what were you thinking, man? I thought you were supposed to be wise. So stupid. How can you turn your back on the Lord like that? Because we never do anything like that, right? You know, ever since Jesus saved us and made us right with God, we've been so careful 
to walk in humble faithfulness, thankful for the cross, thankful for his mercy that covers all of our sin, right? I mean, we open our eyes in the morning with God's name on our lips. We can't wait to get out of bed so we can thank him for this new life that he's given us. We grab our Bible and we devour our daily reading, our daily bread, the food for our soul. We pray for our family and our friends and our church. We can't wait for Sunday when we get to come together in Jesus' name to worship God. Man, we don't let anything stand in the way of that, right? Nothing is more important to us than worshiping God, right? You know, Solomon, he built that amazing temple, but it says he barely bothered to go. Like he went to worship a few times a year, which sounds like most lame Christians in America, if you ask me. So is it a surprise when all the false gods that we actually do worship every day, that those false gods, that they take over our hearts? Is that surprising to any of us? The false gods of power and greed and sex and fear, politics and news and sports and entertainment, pride and laziness and selfish comforts, anger and lust and envy, our jobs, our families, our hobbies. See, we have plenty of time for all those things, don't we? I think too often we make worshiping God a complete afterthought. Listen, the thing that brings the judgment of God down over and over throughout the scriptures is neglecting worship. Worshiping false idols instead of worshiping God. God, breaking the first commandment. And for us, man, if that isn't making everything in the world a reason for us to skip church, making everything more of a priority than gathering here as the church to worship, well, then I don't know what else it would be. David sinned horribly, and it had massive consequences in his life. But he was still called a man after God's own heart. He's still considered to be the greatest king. Does that make any sense? Do you understand why that might be the case? It's because even in his sin, he didn't turn his heart to false gods. He didn't neglect worship. David wrote half the Psalms. He made praising God his biggest priority. He wrote psalms and prayers, liturgies. He hired musicians and choirs. The temple hadn't even been built yet. But the true glory days of worship, they were during the reign of King David. So as we're reading through Kings, we need to consider what the unfaithfulness of the church in our day, what that brings on us. Remember when God said to Solomon, he said, let me apply what he said to Solomon to the church. If you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the commands that I've given you, if you serve and worship other gods, I will make the church an object of mockery and ridicule. Everyone will be appalled and will gasp in horror. We should not be surprised that the church is so looked down on in our culture. Why should anyone take our faith seriously if we're not going to? This has been my frustration with American Christianity since I was a teenager. It's the reason I became a pastor. But I usually just feel like I'm beating my head against a brick wall. The gospel of Jesus is about a lot more than just getting saved and going to heaven. It's supposed to saturate every aspect of our lives, which all starts with taking worship seriously. 
And this is the main message of the book of Kings. It's the reason everything goes bad for Israel. It's not really because the people commit sins. It's because they neglect God and they worship false things. Solomon is the beginning of the end. When he dies, his son Rehoboam, he takes the throne. And in his first speech as king, he says, my father beat you with whips, but I will beat you with scorpions. Real charmer that one. Rehoboam starts a civil war. The Northern Kingdom, also called Israel, Ephraim, or Samaria, in other parts of the Bible, the Northern Kingdom, it splits from the Southern Kingdom, which is also called Judah, or Jerusalem. But since the Temple is in the Southern Kingdom, in Jerusalem, the Northern Kingdom of Israel, they build their own places of worship. They build two of them, in fact. And unbelievably, in both of them, they not only make graven images to worship, you'll never be able to make sense of this next part, no matter how hard you try. They make two giant golden calves. It's like they definitely read the book of Exodus, but they completely missed the point. The rest of the book of Kings is a pathetic record of about 20 northern kings and 20 southern kings. Almost every one of them does their worst to drive the kingdom straight into the ground. And the way God can tell the good kings from the bad kings was real simple. Did they lead the people to worship God alone, or did they encourage demonic idolatry? Well, there were no good kings in the northern kingdom. None, not one. In the southern kingdom, where a descendant of David always sat on the throne, it wasn't much better. Only eight out of 20. God did send some pretty awesome prophets to the northern kingdom, though. Two of the coolest guys in the whole Bible. And they did their best to fight against the wickedness of, like, the notorious King Ahab and his infamous, bloodthirsty Canaanite wife, Jezebel. Elijah, the prophet, he's a wild man. He calls down fire from heaven against the prophets of Baal. And then when God took him to heaven in a chariot of fire, Elijah didn't die. Elijah didn't die. He just rode up to heaven. Then his replacement, his mentor, his ment uh, the guy he, he uh, brought up into the profiting, this guy named Elisha, who did twice as many miracles as Elijah but I'm very fond of him because he was bald. <laughs> but you couldn't tease him about it. See 2 Kings 2.23, if you wonder about how that goes. <laughs> prophets or no prophets, the northern kingdom refused to worship God. And in 722 BC, the Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom once and for all. And they became known as the 10 lost tribes of Israel gone from the face of the earth. The southern kingdom, it chugged on for about another hundred years. And during those years, man, they actually had a couple of the best kings, men who loved God and who led a lot of reform during their reigns. Hezekiah, he stood up against the Assyrians. By faith, God saves the day. Josiah, he finds a lost scroll of the books of Moses in the temple. And he starts a bona fide religious revival. But it was also during this time that the worst king of them all, a monster named King Manasseh, brought demonic worship into the temple itself, started making child sacrifices. The Book of Kings had started with Solomon building the temple, making a bunch of promises to be faithful. But it ends about 400 years later with the complete destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of the temple, the people of God being taken away as slaves into exile to Babylon. It's a horrific story. The last king who reigned in Jerusalem, he had to watch the Babylonians murder his family 
before they gouged out his eyes. So that would be the last thing he ever saw. It seems pretty hopeless. Like the end, like it's over. This nation who was saved from Egypt, given the promised land, given the promise that a descendant of David would always sit on the throne of Israel, if the people were faithful, if Israel kept the covenant, but they didn't. And now it seems like it's all over. But in the last chapter, there's one little glimmer of hope. The king of Babylon, he invites Jehoiachin, a descendant of David who would have been king. He invites him to eat at his royal table for the rest of his life. It's not much, but we're kind of left thinking, maybe this isn't the end after all. Well, the next two books of the Bible are 1st and 2nd Chronicles. They tell pretty much the same story as Samuel and Kings, but from a very different perspective, because it only tells the story of the southern kingdom of Judah, the line of David. And the last paragraph in Chronicles, it talks about the return of Israel from exile after 70 years of captivity, where the book of Kings is a warning about what happens if we fail to worship God alone, the book of Chronicles, it paints a picture of hope for a future messianic king who's going to come to reign and live with his people. Prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they give us a lot more details about what that's going to look like, that promise of the Messiah and the promise of a new temple. So that brings us back to today, Palm Sunday. A descendant of King David is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, which is the symbol of a king to them. The people shouted, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of Yahweh the Lord. They're under Roman occupation, but they say hail to the king of Israel. And this is Jesus. This is the miracle working rabbi who claimed to not only be the Messiah, but also the Son of God, Yahweh himself. And the first thing he's going to do when he gets inside those gates of Jerusalem, he's going to go into the temple. He's going to drive out the money changers and the people that are turning God's house into a den of thieves. It's the same guy who said, if this temple was torn down, he would rebuild it in three days. He wasn't talking about the building, but he was talking about the temple. This guy riding on a donkey, he's not just the Messiah, the prophet, priest, and king who was promised to Adam and Eve and to Abraham and to Moses and to David and to Solomon. He's also the promised temple. He is the location of the special presence of God on the earth. He's also the entire nation of Israel reduced to one man. See, they had never been able to keep the covenant. They had not been able to be faithful. So he was going to do it for them. Pretend like you don't know where this story's going for a minute. He's not only the promised Messiah, the King, and the Temple. He's also going to be the priest and sacrifice to once and for all, for all time, save his people. He's going to willingly sacrifice his life to rescue Israel from all those thousands of years of unfaithfulness. And not only Israel, but everyone who believes and calls on his name will be saved. Which brings this whole thing to us today. Maybe you felt the heat earlier when I was talking about going to church and 
making the worship of God a priority. Maybe you feel like you've turned your back on the Lord so many times, just like Solomon and all those rotten, unfaithful kings. Maybe you have. Actually, I know you have, and so have I. That's why Jesus rode into Jerusalem and did what he did, because we couldn't. That's why we're still saying the same thing today that that crowd said 2,000 years ago. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord, save us. A prophet named Zechariah, he said something to the people of God after they had been saved brought back from exile to Babylon. And he was talking about something that was gonna happen 400 years later on that day that we call Palm Sunday. He said, see, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurch.love slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.